Hi, this is Bud Becker, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio. Hello, this is John Piat, Kevin Schmidt, and Jerry Bozick. And we're, we're August, August, a little band from Virginia. You can hear our story, other stories from the legendary Baltimore, D.C. music scene, and much, much more with Michael Spedden on Foul Players Radio. You can find it at www.foulplayersradio.com, on YouTube, and wherever you find podcasts online. Keep, Keep rocking. rocking. This is Just Bill. This is Rat Bastardson. And this is Joe Poodle from Red Die Number Nine, and you are listening to Foul Players Radio. This is Foul Players Radio, your podcast for arts, entertainment, and pop culture. Welcome. My name is Michael Spedden, your host. Every episode features fun, fascinating stories about people in the performing arts, actors, authors, dancers, writers, musicians, athletes, you name it. Folks who are center stage, backstage, on camera, or behind the scenes. Sit back and listen. Let's have some fun. Foul Players Radio is a proud production of the Foul Players Group and the official podcast of the Foul Players of Perryville. And folks, welcome back to another episode of Foul Players Radio. Tonight, we have Jay Nedry from the Road Ducks. Uh, Jay and I uh, talked a lot about the uh, music scene here in the Mid-Atlantic, you know, all the venues and all the uh, people that the Road Ducks have performed with over the last 46 or 47 years. And I really had a blast talking to him. You know, Jay is just full of great stories and, um, you know, shared a lot of great experiences and it turned out we knew a lot of the same people i really think you're going to enjoy this episode um there was so much information that we're going to divide this into a second episode as well there will be a part two of this um which will be coming out soon as well so um you can find information on jay nedry and the road ducks at www.theroadducks.com and you'll find their schedule on there. I mean, gosh, they've got shows out the wazoo for the rest of the year. Um, you can buy some merch. You can read about their history. They've really got a very complete and very interesting website, which I urge you all to look at, too. So uh, stick around, folks. We will be right back with Jay Nedry right after these words. Hello, listeners. We at Foul Players Radio thank you for all of your support over the past 10 seasons and nearly 300 episodes. We would like to encourage you to keep listening and spread the word. Audio versions of all episodes can be found on our main website, foulplayersradio.com, as well as on many of the other platforms you can see here. You can find all of our Season 9 and 10 episodes, as well as some Best of Episodes and Shorts on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at foulplayersradio. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to get alerts when new episodes are released. No matter what platform you choose to listen, you can help us greatly by hitting the subscribe button and giving us an honest review. You can also help us by supporting us at patreon.com slash foulplayersradio or at buymeacoffee.com slash foulplayerw. Your support makes it possible for us to continue to be your one-stop shop for all of your pop culture needs. Be sure to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for new episode announcements and news and updates on all of our guests. Thank you, and enjoy this episode. Hey, this is Brian Damage from Kix and Rhino Bucket, and you're listening and watching Foul Players Radio. Hi, this is Kim of Kim's Crypt, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio. (laughs) This is A.D. Adams, and you are tuned in to Foul Players Radio with your host, Michael Spedden. Yeah, hi, this is David Simmons from DC Star, and I am just encouraging all of you to tune in to Michael Spedden's show on Foul Players Radio, and love the rock and roll of the past and the art of the future. And folks, welcome back to another episode of Foul Players Radio. Tonight, we are here with Jay Nedry, one of the founding members of the Road Ducks, a band that has just got so much history in this area here. They've been around since 1976. And according to their website, I'm not, you know, this is, um, it looks like fairly recent information. It's 5,700 shows in every state from Texas to Maine. 
And they've performed with such great acts. I mean, look at this lineup of acts they performed with Leonard Skinnerd, the Allman Brothers, Charlie Daniels, Marshall Tucker, 38 Special, The Outlaws, Molly Hatchet, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Blackfoot, Fog Hat, and as it says here, others too numerous to mention. Um, wow. I mean, this is so much history. And, you know, Jay, I've, you know, I've seen your ads i've i remember um the articles written by the senator and maryland musician years ago and welcome to the show i'm i'm absolutely Thanks, thrilled to have you tonight so uh welcome happy to be here it's it's a pleasure and uh, i'm glad we're able to get together here on a wednesday evening and a happy spring to you and everybody thank you thank you so much thank you so much um I really, um, I was really thrilled to get this here. You know, this podcast was founded, you know, five years ago to really track, you know, the history and entertainment in this region here. And, um, you know, I've just been trying to get people one by one, and I was really thrilled. Um, it was uh, a young man um, that works with the, uh, oh, uh, his name escapes me, Milstead. Um, Michael. 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 Uh, reached out to me. Um, he had seen the podcast on Facebook where I post it and had said, why don't you get the road ducks? And I was like, duh, how did I not think it? But I'm glad that he did bring it up. And I'm glad that you were receptive to this. Um, I mean, in this area here, you know, I've performed in this area for years um, in, you know, not only bands, but theater, you know, acting, comedy, and there's just a lot of great talent and a lot of great history within this area, um, you know, alone, let alone what goes on, you know, in the, you know, the bigger entertainment centers like New York. Now we've got Nashville. So, um, so tell me about this. I, I want to know all about this history here. You know, from the beginning, you told me you started playing uh, in bands when you were just a youngin. I, uh, you know, like many, I was born in 1950. So, uh, uh -huh. Like many people, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Sure. And that, sure. Uh, and, and I was in the eighth grade, and uh, I'd uh, been playing in the school band, been playing drums, and it just lit me up. And I'd been saving money. I'd been selling donuts so I could afford a drum set. And I got my first drum set in uh, December of 64 uh -huh. and started playing in my first band. And uh, it was something I really wanted to do. Uh -huh. And uh, my dad was a lawyer and very right wing Republican. And uh, I got sent off to military school at the age of 14 uh -huh. uh, at the Stanton Military Academy, where, um, you know, to keep me from hanging around with dirtbag musician types and, you know, people that hang out at <laughs> night, trippers and, and bar owners and bartenders and crazy people, uh -huh. all my friends. And, uh, <laughs> but. This military school uh, was a, a the school was started in 1860. So when I got there, it had been there for a hundred and some years, but it had a colorful array of uh, fellow dirtbags from around <laughs> the country who had rich fathers that were tired of the kid making a pain in the ass out of himself. Um, Larry Cummings, who later became Johnny Ramone, mm -hmm. was a classmate. Uh, Bruce Crump is one of the guys that was really instrumental in my life because Bruce was a uh, in the junior school when I was a senior at Stanton. Sure. And we were both drummers, and Bruce was the founding member of Molly Hatchet. Wow. And, uh, we were The Road Ducks were living in New Haven, Connecticut in 1978 when Hatchet did their first tour. So we went down to this club in New Haven, the Oxford Ale House, to see him play. And Bruce and I had, neither one of us had had a haircut in 10 years or whatever it was. So uh, at first we looked at each other and then started talking, and uh, he was like, wow. I can't believe that, you know, we went to military school together and stuff. So we opened for them a couple of times and uh, we got turned on to their agency, this agency called the Empire Agency in Atlanta. And they represented the Allman Brothers and Blackfoot and Wet Willie and the Outlaws and Marshall Tucker and all the Southern bands. So we got hooked up with them and we wound up buying a huge PA and lighting system. And uh, we found out we could make $100 a night as the opening act, but we could make a couple 3000 uh being the opening act and having production. So we would provide the sound and lights and we would do uh, Raleigh, uh, Richmond, Norfolk, uh, DC, Baltimore, Philly, uh, New York, Connecticut, or uh, North Jersey, and do five or six nights with these guys in the 80s. 
and we get to do one set a night. The uh, clubs that hold about a thousand, fifteen hundred people, we're all sold out. So we get these big crowds of people that come to see us. We got to do our best material because we only had to play for an hour, and we got to use our sound and lights. And uh, we became real close with a lot of these bands and did multiple dates, you know, hundreds of dates with with Hatchet and and uh, the Outlaws and Blackfoot and uh, Marshall Tucker and. Uh, did uh, 10 days with Stevie Ray Vaughan on his first U.S. tour. And uh, you'll learn a lot from playing with people like that and mm-hmm. paying attention to what they have to say and listening to their stories and the different people that are with them and just kind of observing things. And so it was a real education for us to be able to be exposed to these not only very talented people, but, you know, we're a bunch of rednecks from Virginia. <laughs> and you know these are these guys are they're from Macon, man. They're from they're worldly. They've been all around. They've been to Memphis. They've been to Hollywood. So you know they knew things and they shared. And uh, that was the thing about the Southern bands. There was a great deal of camaraderie. Mm, there wasn't yeah, the, the yeah. cock blocking that went on with the hair bands and stuff, mm-hmm. where everybody was trying to you know whatever it was. There was a different a definite difference in the scene. And for us being from Virginia, you know, in Fairfax and Loudoun counties, Northern Virginia a very wealthy, very white collar. And mm-hmm. we would go play Baltimore, which is blue collar. Yep. So, you know, you're playing one type of venue in Virginia and then you're going, and I remember in particular playing a, a Tuesday night at the Sandbar down mm-hmm. in Pasadena in the late seventies. And, you know, about 1030, the crowd empties out. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to suck. We got to be until two in the morning. And now, and all of a sudden about 1115, this massive amount of people come in second shift yep gotten off at 10 30 11 o'clock mm-hmm. and these people just came in and of course at two in the morning they're pushing them out the door mm-hmm. so there was a big difference in the crowds and the appreciation and the way you had to approach things uh in baltimore it was a lot more um you had to really bust your ass because there was a lot of competition there was a lot more places to play in baltimore mm-hmm. there was a lot of bands that were really really good oh yeah you know, mannequin, crack the sky, mm-hmm. uh, a Sinbad. Uh, there were so many just fabulous Baltimore face dancer. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a DC Star, just great, great bands. And the drummer for DC Star, Glenn Jones, and I. Glenn was another classmate from Stanton Military Academy. So, yeah. uh, Glenn's uh, been a guest. He's a wonderful guy. We've known each other since we were teenagers. Oh, he absolutely and, you know, is. But he's another guy that has. And the, and the one thing about these Southern bands. If you watch that history of, of Rossington Collins or Leonard Skinner, mm-hmm. you know, all of the guys, it, it, they worked their ass off. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are guys that, I mean, they worked and they practiced and they did what they had to do. And, you know, when you don't have a lot of money and you still got to be able to eat and a lot of things, it takes a lot of finesse. So this was not a bunch of dumbass country boys. This, this mm-hmm. was a bunch of shrewd. Uh, they might not have uh, been as sophisticated and well-educated going to prep schools and college and stuff but they were good businessmen and they knew what to do and so they passed on this work ethic the harder you work you know the more results you're going to wind up getting and if you know Mm -hmm. you get it it's like a computer garbage in garbage out so that's why we were doing 320 330 dates a year and loving it the fact we could take the band on the road like the freaking circus we're just Mm going to pack everybody up and we're just going to move to connecticut and we're going to go play maine we're going to go play massachusetts and I told the guys, I said, look, man, we can play around Northern Virginia and see all our high school and college friends forever. And they'll blow smoke up our ass and tell us how wonderful we are. Let's go 400 miles from home. Well, we don't know anybody. Let's mm-hmm. play in front of strangers. And then if we got something, if we can get hired back and people like us up there in Connecticut, and New England, then we got something. You mm-hmm. know, the old, if it'll play in Peoria, it'll play anywhere. So we go up there and we just played seven nights a week, not only to pay the hotel and food bills, but there were so many places to play because the population was such in a concentrated area in New England. 25, 30 million people mm-hmm. live in this short, small area, whereas down south, it's a long way to the Shenandoah Valley. There's a lot sure. of small towns, 20, 25,000 people that are 30, 40 miles apart. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of distances in new england you didn't have to go that you did have to go in virginia yep you yep. could have a lot of people see you so we were able to woodshed up there from 77 till 1980 and then move back to virginia moved to virginia beach and we were a completely different band and we'd uh, from living in new haven which was midway between boston 
in New York City, yeah, we got to see all the great Boston acts and mm-hmm. all the great New York City acts and stuff. And and you know, played Long Island a lot. Got to meet the guys in Twisted Sister and Zebra. <laughs> yeah, you know, phenomenal bands: Southern Cross, Stanton Anderson, Harlequin. I mean, and these guys, the the Good Rats, these guys were at a completely different level than what we were used to seeing in Virginia and West Virginia and Western Maryland and stuff. So it really made you bring your game up so you could compete with these people. And that's one of the benefits of traveling. And then from my buddies from military school, we started playing in, in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Naples, and then the Be- Key West. We got to play Sloppy Joe's for 10 years. And it was like, you're going to pay me, pay me to go. <laughs> Excuse me. You're going to pay me to go to Key West for two weeks. You're going to let me play music from 10 o'clock at night till three in the morning on the strip in front of audiences from all around the world. I mean, it was just magic. And then uh, from uh, 82 to 92, we were the house band at the Purple Moose mm, in yeah. Ocean City yeah. on the boardwalk. Mm-hmm. And once again, and let me get this straight. You're going to give me a house. You're going to pay me a lot of money. You're going to give us alcohol and let me play from Memorial Day to Labor Day all summer long on the beach in Ocean City. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, yeah. you know, what a gig. <laughs> and so in the winters, you go to Sloppy Joe's. and the summers, you're playing Ocean City. I mean, in Woodshed, you're learning how to do this. You're learning how to play. You're learning how to ab- absorb a great number of styles of music. So when we put out our records, we never wanted to be a one-trick pony. That's why the two records we've released in the past mm-hmm. have all got different sounds on them. And this third record we're doing now is going to be completely different, I'm sure, than uh, what people are expecting. So I've been able to change the band. I've got new guys in the group. I'm the only original guy, but uh, we've got a phenomenal singer. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he's very talented. And uh, everybody else is kind of, you know, everybody sings and supports him. And uh, so we've got a, a, a unique sound that, that's very germane to the road ducks and the legacy of the band and what we've tried to project, you know, having a good time and uh, great vocals and strong guitars. Mm-hmm. So that's what we've been doing. We've been playing a lot. I got things reorganized and now we've got uh, only have a dozen dates left to book between now and the end of the year. And uh, the band has never done better. And we'll have this record out by Labor Day. I was looking at your uh, schedule and I was like, man, you guys don't have a lot of wiggle room in that, huh? It, it looks no, like then, um, you're booked. I mean, you know, wow, look at this. I mean, you've got you got a list of gigs as tall as me. Well, <laughs> you know, we like playing and we play a lot of these places we played for years. Uh, you know, we're house band at several places, uh, Cave mm-hmm. Hill down in McGackiesville, Virginia, and the Harbor Grill and on the Occoquan River and you know, you get to play the Occoquan on Sunday afternoons on the river with your friends. You know, I grew up in Mount Vernon, so it's not far from my boyhood home. So I'm literally in my backyard at sunset playing music on the river. And it just, God, come on, man. Very lucky, very blessed that we get to do this. And uh, the fact that the band can still command uh, good money and, a, and a bring a lot of people. We make people money. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, we have, it, it was great because we went back to, to Essex, where you're from. Yep. And played the Crazy Tuna on April 7th. First time I'd been in Baltimore in 22 years. And we played this one place in particular for years that I loved, a place called the Seagull. Oh, yeah. And, and we were friends with Doc. And just we had so we played there with a lot of bands, Molly Hatchet, Blackfoot, and had a lot of people see us there. Mm-hmm. So as I'm pulling into the Crazy Tuna, I look to the right. And next to it is this place that's closed and they got fencing and it's being rebuilt and I'll be damned if it's not the old seagull. Right. Yeah. So I um, come back right. So after all these years of not playing Baltimore, now I come back and I make the exact same place. I was the <laughs> last time I played in Baltimore. So all these years later I go back, but you know, Baltimore, because of the fact that it is a blue collar town, these people expect uh, to get their ass kicked. You got to go. These people expect you to deliver. They don't mm-hmm. fuck around at all. When they mm-hmm. come out, they're serious about their music. And if they're going to support your band, you got to deliver each and every time because they expect that. These people work hard and by God, they play hard and they expect the same thing from the guys that uh, they come to see. And when you watch the bands in Baltimore that have been successful over the years, that's what they do. They, they do. Learn to, they they do. learn how to deliver it at a very high level. You've had your own band for years, I know. Mm-hmm. 
And that's oh, hard yeah. to do. It is. It is. It's hard to do. Very hard to do. Um, and, and I, and, you know, as you were you know, speaking before, um, you know, played in different markets as well, you know, um, and the thing is, is you're absolutely right. You know, um, you've got Baltimore, DC is a different animal and, um, New York's a different animal too. And Virginia and parts of Pennsylvania, completely different animals. And, um, you got to be ready for that if you're going to go into different markets, uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I remember the first time we went up to New York City to play the Lone Star in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, being a child of the 50s and stuff, I, lo I love doo-wop. And one of my favorite all-time bands is Benny King and the Drifters. Sure. And uh, I always think of that song on Broadway. You know, they say the neon lights are bright. And so as you're, as you're coming down Broadway and you're looking at all these places and these lights and you know the history, if that doesn't fire you up and that doesn't get you excited, you need mm -hmm. to find a different business because it's electric. It is. It, it, when you get to the Big Apple and you know, and the, and the Lone Star was nothing to write. It was nothing elegant. It was a dump. It was small. It wasn't anywhere near as nice as, you know, Hammerjacks or the Hollywood Palace or the Seagull or the places we used to play in Baltimore, yeah, Hammerjacks, come on, that was the, the gold standard for nightclubs in the world. Oh, yeah. You know, and interestingly enough about Hammerjacks, we played there every Monday for a year and a half. The agent for Hammerjacks was a guy named Bud Becker. Oh, he's been a guest about seven times. Bud was my band's agent in the late 60s. I've known mm -hmm. Bud since I was 17. Yeah. And Bud has always helped me. He has been a, he's a good guy. That's always worked. He's loved music. He's done a lot to help bands and promote people. Oh, sure. Since he was very, very young, over 50 years, he's been doing it. And Hammerjacks was a singularly unique experience because at that particular time, you know, it with the business they were doing, you'd meet people there from Boston and Atlanta every weekend that just drove to Hammerjacks just because of what was going on. Oh, absolutely. And at Hammerjack. So there was a different level of things going on at that time in Baltimore with bands and guys that were able to actually play on the circuit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Bud Becker, I was fortunate that we'd been, I'd known him since I was a teenager and he was, he's always helped me. He's helped me recently. Oh, sure. Stuff. sure. But a big shout out to Bud Becker because he's just a great guy and somebody that's really done a lot behind the scenes for music in Baltimore and DC since the late 60s i have to tell you i i absolutely agree with you jay uh, i've had bud as i said i know at least seven times on the show um we did two episodes just on hammerjacks itself um and because the thing is is that he has so much history up here he doesn't um, forget anything he doesn't forget anything and it's phenomenal the amount of detail that he remembers because he, you know, not only, you know, of course your band, he had the Hammerjacks gig, you know, the road on the road. Um, well, he booked the Alexandria roller rink, sure. um, had the doors. I mean, he could, you know, he told me all about the doors show. He told me all about, um, booking black Sabbath and humble pie and young Niels Lofgren. I and, saw that. I saw Black yeah. Sabbath and Humble Pie at the Alexandria Roller Rink. I saw uh, Alice Cooper. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Edgar Winters, White Trash, and mm -hmm. Grin with Nils Lofgren. Yes, Grin. Yeah, he did. Yes, yes. Um, he did another great. He brought an English band called Wishbone Ash. Yes. Mm -hmm. He brought a real heavy New York band called uh, Sir Lord Baltimore. Yep. Bud was really on the cutting edge of the metal scene. And was able to access a lot of acts mm -hmm. that became famous and put out records and stuff. And Bud brought them to the market before they became a big deal. So he really introduced. And then he was friends, Doc McGee from mm -hmm. Philly. Yep. Kiss and, and, and Bon Jovi and all these other acts and stuff. Him and Bud have been thicker than thieves forever. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, Doc was always saying, hey, you know, I just got these guys that I'm considering a management deal with. They're young up. And what do you think? So Bud, of course, would take the act and debut him in Hammerjacks and be able to, you know, have his finger on the pulse of what was happening. Mm -hmm. So he was not only a shrewd judge of talent, 
he had a lot of people that owed him favors. Oh, yeah. He really paved the way for, a, I mean, I to this day, I'd do anything to help Bud Becker. If somebody said that there was something he needed, I'd do it. Mm-hmm. Me Just too. Just because he's always been that way. He's been there for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And it's never been an asshole no, about how successful. And a lot of guys get a little bit of power and clout, mm-hmm. especially in D.C., Oh, yeah. yeah. My dad was a big time Republican lawyer, so I'm used to those people with the attitude and the ego. Sure. But it was the complete opposite. Just a nice laid back. Let's do this. No big deal. See you later. Mm-hmm. You know, you're absolutely right about Bud. I mean, um, like I'd mentioned, he's got so much history and so many stories to tell. And the thing is, it's like, um, you know, he, he could have brushed me aside, but he was willing to come on here and share that history. And as a matter of fact, I owe Bud a phone call. Bud, I'm going to be calling you soon because we're going to be uh, doing this again. But, um, you know, I absolutely, um, you know, we had a list of other acts that he wanted to do episodes on, and it's just phenomenal. He's also introduced me to a number of people in the industry that I've gotten good interviews with, too. You know, a gentleman named uh, David Liebert who was, uh, he just put out a book and he had managed um, Alice Cooper for years, Living sure. Color, George Clinton, Prince. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a phenomenal interview with him as well. Um, you should contact it, a guy from uh, Silver Spring whose name is Mark Opsasnik. Okay. And he's written uh, multiple books called Capital Rock, which is the history of the rock scene in D.C. going back to the 60s and the garage bands and, you know, mm-hmm. Punky Meadows and all of these different acts and he's gotten more and more research and really done it well. And with what you're trying to do, Michael, with this, this, uh, podcast, um, Mark didn't have podcasts when he started doing this 20 years ago, didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So he started doing the old analog way of writing it down, but it's important that this type of history uh, is maintained. I have a degree yeah. in history. I'm getting a master's degree in history from William and Mary. Yeah. And yeah. Primary sources where you actually get to talk to somebody that was involved in it, like a Bud Becker, mm-hmm. as opposed to somebody that's writing about Bud Becker. Right. Is the the primary source is the best way to get information. Mm-hmm. And there should really be some type of book. And maybe you yeah. can talk Mark uh, Sasnick, who knows how to do the research, into doing something similar in conjunction with you. Sure. In Baltimore, because there have been so many, you know, mm-hmm. great, great players and just at climb a donkey. I mean, some of these bands that were just legendary in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. That, uh, John Tracy, the drummer for that band, has played in Crack the Sky and all kind of one of the best drummers ever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just uh, nonetheless, you know, I just think what you're doing is a great idea and I'm happy that I could participate. I appreciate it, Jay. I appreciate it. You know, I've I've had a good, uh, I've had success in reaching a lot of people, and people have been willing to come on. Um, um, since I started this in 2018, um, and I really, it really started gaining momentum in 2020. Um, I've had, I, I did have uh, Face Dancer Scott McGinn. I've had um, David Simmons from DC Star on sure. twice, once with Glenn and once by himself. Um, A.D. Adams, who was a drummer for Monarch. He um, used to play in the Road Ducks, is on my speed dial, and one of my dearest friends on the planet. No kidding. Oh, A.D. A- and I are best. I, I, I started booking his band Monarch when he was 17 and still in high school up in Gaithersburg. Yeah, yeah. See, I've had him on twice. Um, he's he's absolutely outstanding. He's a great guest. Uh, Richard King, Buffalo Lee Jordan, Um Gosh, uh, I know I'm going to leave some people out here, but it, it seems like a lot of the people that I get are drummers too. Um, everybody else blows me off, but the drummers will talk to me. So uh. get, get John <laughs> Allen. John Allen is a fat from uh, Child's Play. Oh, he's amazing. Uh, I just saw him. Um, he was with. I just had Gina Shock as a guest. Sure, another drummer. And uh, John was her drummer. They just did some shows at the Hard Rock. He's and phenomenal. He's he's a very talented guy and a great singer and a good guy. He sure is. He sure is. Um, uh, he's another Dundalk boy, uh, like yeah. I am. Yeah. Um, we used to play at J and D's Saloon. You haven't lived till you played a Saturday night at J and D's. I Dundalk. played there. I played there. Um, and I used to roadie for a band called Winter Sun. Sure. Uh, those guys, um, and I played in a band with Johnny, an acoustic duo, Johnny sure. Trotta, for uh, years. Um, when I was a young young kid, those guys kind of took me under their wing and showed me the ropes and mentored sure. me. 
Um, and I was their roadie for a long time. Um, it's an it's an apprenticeship. It is. It really is. <laughs> it really is. And um, and you're lucky when you get guys that will put up with the fact you don't know anything. Yeah. That will kind of teach you how to do stuff when you're really in the way, no matter how enthusiastic or helpful you want to be. Oh yeah, yeah. You know the routine. You know you're a pain in the ass. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. And they were they were good enough and willing to uh, take me under their wing back then. And um, I, yeah, I worked with those guys for a long time, and they're just dear, dear friends of mine, uh, Bobby and Johnny Trotta. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, and you know, of course then, the, you know, there's the other members too, that I you know, was good friends with and still am to this day, you know, you run into them. Um, I've also had, uh, Dave Nachotsky from invisible sound studios on, um, he had some great stories, uh, red dye number nine. Um, oh gosh, I mean, I know I'm going to forget people and, you know, by the time we hang up, I'll be like, oh God, I should have brought them up. You but you should get Don Wayner. Don Wainer's a promoter agent in the area and stuff, and he's he's been thicker than thieves with Bud Becker forever. But Don Wainer is a guy that, at a club called Louis Rock City, Don Wainer was instrumental mm -hmm. yeah, in yeah. bringing many of the national acts there and stuff. And Don is still a promoter mm -hmm. in the Baltimore area. He's not only a, a very bright guy and a very, very nice man, mm -hmm. he's another one that's a font of information in particular on yep. Baltimore yep. music since the 70s, way back in the Face Dancer days. Yep. Mm hmm. Yep. Face dancer. Um, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I had Scott McGinn on, he was great and he's been very supportive too. And I also got in touch with a guy named Doug McCooch. Sure. Um, I've had another drummer. All right. From Diamond <laughs> you Alley. Know? You know yeah. who else? I, I'll tell you what I will, when I get off the horn with you, I'll text you Mike Tremonti. I've had him from, from the Bayou. Yeah, I had Mike as a guest too. Okay, because um, Mike's another one that just knows, you know. A oh, he lot was of stuff wonderful. DC music scene. He's a great guy and a good man. He was wonderful, and um, and oh yeah, when we were just talking about John Allen. Um, he had this drum. I just the one thing I always remember about Child's Play, um, was the fact that he had this drum set. It sounded they sounded like freaking cannons. Absolutely. His drums. I don't know what if. I, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm a bass player. So I was pretty much, you know, uh, I always look at everybody's rig and their you know gear and you know, look at that, but um, didn't pay much attention to drums, but his drums were like cannons going off. I don't know what kind of kid he had or how he did that, but um, they had they, a, a, a singer back before Brian Jack became the uh, front Larry. guy. Yeah. Larry, who mm -hmm. was, I thought was terrific. I thought he was as good as the guy from ACDC and he could yes. do things with his voice. He had that Bond that were, Scott, yeah. Yeah, he could do things with his voice that were painful mm -hmm. to listen to. But we did a lot of shows with them yeah, all yeah. over Baltimore, and we'd see them on the road and stuff. Nikki, I knew all of them. They were a great bunch of guys, and they, they were a, another very hardworking band. Mm -hmm. And they were all, we were, all of us were happy mm -hmm. that we were tired all the time and had dirty laundry, but, you know, uh -huh. we were happy we were doing what we were doing, and we were in that position where we had dirty laundry. From yes. being on the road. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Kim it's... Yates was another one I've had on from Scarlet Angel. Um, sure. Dear friend, um, not only have I, uh, we in, did some shows with them back in the 80s in the band I was in back then, but then um, I've also worked at her haunt as an actor, uh, Kim's Crypt, and that's a that's a blast. Um, cool. Had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but Kim, yeah, Kim, another drummer. See, that's just the, the They're drummers. Everywhere. Yeah. They're everywhere. Yeah. yeah acting um, is acting is fun. It is. It really is. It really is. Um, and like you were saying before about New York too, you know, how humbling it is up there. I had the opportunity to play CBGBs a few times and, um, not only there, you know, that was just an amazing experience. Um, just don't drop your keys in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, when, when we walked into CBGBs, I went, okay where's the club? Yeah, yeah I, I know. You know, I thought it was like the front room and the, and the club. Yeah. You know, it was in yeah. the back where they'd have a stage and all this stuff. And right. No, that, that was it. Uh, the smell was unique. <laughs> um, and the bathroom, you know, I mean, I've been in some really nasty places. Okay. Yes. I yes. Mean, nasty. I'm sure you have as well. <laughs> oh, brutal. This, this was at a particular level. This was a level of expertise I've never seen. Yeah, I, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. That you know, my God, how could you ever let things get this out of control? And what the hell is your health department doing? But it was, 
part of the ambiance, the charm. Yeah. Same thing with all those clubs in the village, Kenny's mm -hmm. Castaways, mm -hmm. and, and the Bitter End. They were dumps. Yep. You know, yep. the bathrooms were nasty. They hadn't been cleaned or fixed in years, but it was the music scene and the fact you were playing in the village or you're playing New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was a lot better than playing, you know, Winchester. I mean, no mm -hmm. offense to Winchester, but man, you know, you're playing on in Manhattan mm -hmm. on a Friday night. It's a big damn deal, man, and it it's electric. It's exciting, you know. Yeah, I and uh, another thing, you know, going up to New York as an actor, um, getting you know some of the places that I've gone to a lot of like since pandemic. It's all over Zoom now, but it, we were, you know, you would have to go up there to audition, um, sure. even if it was just for five seconds. You'd take the train up and get back on the train and leave. But sure. going into some of these buildings up there and knowing the history of these buildings, and, you know, I've, I've been to auditions on Tin Pan Alley um, and knowing who's worked in these buildings and what has happened here, um, it's it's humbling. I mean, you, know, you walk in there, it's like, you know, if, if these walls could talk or, you know, um, it, it's just, it, it's, 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 it's a the blessing. creativity that yeah. those particular physical spaces housed. Mm -hmm. It's not the physical space itself. Right. It's the creativity. Cause you know, mm -hmm. that Tin Pan Alley was there since the 1890s mm -hmm. and that's a lot of talent. That's a lot of creativity. ASCAP, yep. all of these different things mm -hmm. came out of that as, yeah. as, a, as part of the whole Broadway, and mm -hmm. then motion pictures, radio, all of these different mediums that were new yeah. and burgeoning yeah. at this time that became, you know, things today that everybody assumes are just part of the landscape. At this time, these were new and developing technologies. Right. That they really right. didn't know what to do with or how to do things with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was new to everybody. Yeah. And yeah. look what radio did. Sure. You know, and how radio changed the dynamic. Had you ever performed in the Catskills? Well, of course, we played up at Hunter Mountain okay. for years, you know, yeah. the ski resorts up there and stuff. And uh, Catskills, an old Dutch word that means where the land meets the sky. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful place. It's a couple hours north of the city. Yeah. And uh, we played up there a lot uh, in uh, Albany, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Poughkeepsie, you know, WPDH, the voice of the Hudson Valley. Um, <laughs> there were some, just some great places and, and really cool people and, and, you know the ski resorts mm -hmm. you know we we're used to the beach we're used to the summer times we're used to key west we're used to fort lauderdale daytona ocean city uh, uh, uh rehoboth and now you're playing ski resorts where it, it's it's a, a different different type of animal it's a completely different mm -hmm. uh breed of cat uh you'd see some of the same people but uh, uh generally completely different audiences and stuff so you but that was the thing that was the the universal uh, nature of playing all these different markets mm -hmm. you kind of absorb the best of, of what was happening in both you'd kind of take a synthesis this works this works this works mm -hmm. you'd learn what would work everywhere as opposed to certain songs that only worked regionally right right so you know there was a big difference in some of the regional music and stuff and we learned that from touring and playing and and learning what worked and looking at the jukeboxes in the area to see what people are listening to and listening to the local radio Mm -hmm. And reading the local press, you know, and just kind of looking at it in a little bit more uh, perusive, uh, intellectual way uh, to kind of understand the data mm -hmm. that we were looking at and what it meant and how would it how would it impact us, impact us and what could we do to improve our performance and the whole business aspect of us from absorbing this mm -hmm. different kind of information from these different places. And it was really eye opening, illuminating. Mm -hmm. It was such, um, I've always been fascinated. I've watched a lot of documentaries and read a number of books just about the the history of showbiz in the Catskills, you know, how that area came to be, um, the people that came up in that area. And my wife and I took a trip up there last year. You know, we visited Bethel, you know, where the actual Woodstock Festival sure, was. Sure. Um, and we drove around, and the thing that was kind of sad was, you know, seeing the ruins of some of these legendary hotels, like the Grossingers and Cutchers and other ones that are around. Um, my, uh, you know, my, on a side note, my grandfather um, was in the Grossingers Hall of Fame um, as a member of the Chorus of the Chesapeake. They used to do their um, 
barbershop conventions up there and then they would perform up there and then my he and my grandmother would go up there on their own for vacation because they liked it so much but when you i was reading some books about these you know browns cutchers grossingers like i'd mentioned and these people that became big stars you know for example buddy hackett would perform henny, at henny, this henny youngman henny youngman you know buddy hackett would perform at night in the hotel, but then during the day he'd get up in the morning and be renting skis out at the booth where the, you get your skis, and then in the summertime he'd be shoveling out the horse stalls Absolutely. and then performing at night. Alan King actually had a bed behind the curtains of the stage where he would sleep and he would perform at night. Then he would sleep back there. To, you know that's how he earned his keep up there, and so many others. But I mean, it's just. And I, I've been lucky enough to interview some people that have performed up there and just told me some wonderful stories. Um, but that's why, again, that's the purpose of the podcast, you know, and I appreciate you uh, joining us too, because um, this, this stuff has to be preserved. Absolutely. It's important. Know? And that the Borscht Belt was mm -hmm. such a training ground because you could go up there and hone your act yes, six or yes. seven nights a week mm -hmm. and then maybe come to the city and get a you know a ninety second slot on Sullivan yep. or the Tonight Show mm -hmm. or one of those because you know Ed Sullivan was a was an old vaudeville impresario yes so mm -hmm. he was he helped a lot of people somebody's career might not be doing too well Sullivan would give the guy forty five seconds and all of a sudden that's a boost in the arm because the guy's agent could say what do you mean he's not relevant he just did Sullivan for Christ's sake mm -hmm. so Ed mm -hmm. Sullivan was constantly renewing stuff and helping people and keeping his finger in the pie and. A lot of people owed Ed Sullivan favors. He helped oh. a lot of people. Oh, he and that's sure why did. That belt, that was the training ground for so many. They could go up there and work and live and mm -hmm. then come to New York and say, okay, what do you think of me now? Because I've I've honed my craft. And it was the same like L.A. Mm -hmm. You want to go play rock and roll? Take your music to the Sunset Strip. That's a real uh, leveling ground. That They'll show you how good you are out there or show you mm -hmm. how good you aren't. Oh, quick. yeah. You can find out about the Road Ducks at theroadducks.com. There are schedules on there. You can buy some merch, all their bios, and their story is there. We've had Jay Nedry with us tonight, you know, one of the founding members. And, uh, Jay, it's been a wonderful conversation, buddy. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate your time, Michael. It's been a real pleasure, and I look forward to coming back. Thank you. Thanks. And, folks, Jay Nedry, and we will see you next time on Foul Players Radio. Hey, Mary Jo Peel here, and you are listening to Foul Players Radio. Hi, this is Kathy Ladman, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio, the place where you get all of your good news information. Not really, but it's just a great show. Hello, my name is Gunil Carling, and you are listening to Foul Players Radio, and I am interviewed here, so tune in. Hi, this is Paul Castiglia, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio, the one-stop shop for all your pop culture needs. Oh, so man here, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio. Wait, foul? That looks fair. No, it's foul. It's a it's foul players radio. Hi everybody, Dwight Weems from Gaz the Fun Band, and you're watching and listening to Foul Players Radio. And folks, uh, Michael Spedden here. Um, thank you again for tuning in to listen to this uh, first part of uh, the Jay Nedry episodes uh we will have jay back very soon to record a part two to share more stories and experiences and i really got a kick out of this episode tonight and i think you did too uh remember www.foulplayersradio.com or youtube.com slash at foul players radio uh for all of our episodes and remember hit that like or hit that subscribe and like button and we will see you next time on Foul Players Radio, folks. Take care.